Welcome to the 402nd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Carter Wilson, author of the new novel, The Dead Husband. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is USA Today bestselling writer Carter Wilson, author of the new psychological thriller novel, The Dead Husband. Carter, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Sure. If someone hasn't heard about your new novel, The Dead Husband, yet, how would you describe the novel? Oh, I would probably describe it as like <laughs> intense family drama. I, I wanted to write a story about two sisters and it quickly got very dark. So it's essentially a sister returning home to her childhood town and uncovering and reliving some of the things from her past. And so do you remember the original impetus or idea that led you to write The Dead Husband? Well, with, yeah, all of my books are standalone thrillers and none of them are outlined. I just don't know. I've never been able to outline. So I usually just start with a very vague idea. It's either a vague idea or a direct opening scene that I don't know even what it means. And then I just take it from there. And yeah, I, I had this idea that I just wanted to write about two sisters who were estranged and I wanted to start figuring out what that story meant and what it would look like. And if a sister had to come home to be back with the the sibling she grew up with, what tensions are there? What secrets were they hiding? So it just evolved from there. So it was a very vague idea, but that's the best part of writing. It's just uncovering what the story is actually about. Sure. I, I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that there's obviously everybody writes uh, their novel in different ways. I do know that there are people, and I'll just mention the extreme end, where the example would be like Jeffrey Deaver, who I've actually interviewed on the podcast before, who will write an outline for four or five months before he ever writes the first word of the novel. And then, as you just said, that you go into a novel without outlining. I'm just curious, do you, in terms of your method, do you ever find yourself at a dead end? Or do you find yourself also throwing away sections? If you later in the book feel like you have a better idea, do you go back and maybe tweak or or even remove some sections? Could you talk about that process a little bit more? Yeah, I never quite feel that I hit a dead end because I think, you know, I think stories like life are, are unpredictable and can evolve in a number of different storylines. So I think of all the ways that my previous books that are published could have turned out and they probably would have been just different stories, but also just fine. But yeah, to answer your question about throwing stuff out, absolutely. There's I'll get three quarters of the way through a book and realize this character really isn't really explaining why they're doing what they're doing. So I need to layer in a backstory or I need to take out some of the decisions that they made and have them go a different direction. 
And sometimes you don't you don't see it until it's done, and then you realize, oh wow, this needs to be rewritten pretty substantially. But outlining is just something that yeah, I've tried outlining, and I'll get about three chapters into an outline, and all of a sudden my brain takes off and wants to go in an entirely different direction. And again, that's the joy for me, right? Is the the off roading, even if it leads to uh, serious rewrites later on. Sure, sure. What is the appeal to you of writing thrillers and psychological suspense novels? That's a good question. I, I started writing out of the blue when I was 33 it, with no no background in writing, my business degree. And literally on a day, I started writing and it was this kind of a, a little bit of a lightning bolt. So that's a long way of saying I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I wanted to create stories that had tension and had conflict. That was just interesting to me. And when I got an agent, she was the one who told me, she's like, oh, you write thrillers. I'm like, oh, I do? I didn't know that's what I wrote. I just was <laughs> writing this story that had some murder. In it. So I, yeah, I, I like that conflict. I like stakes that are high for an everyday person. And I like trying to, I, I explore the empathy of well, what would I do in this situation? I, that's Somehow that's just fun for me. It's living vicariously without having the real danger present. Sure. I'm curious, can we go back to that day when you were 33? What Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What what made you sit down? And had you, you said you hadn't done any writing before that, but were you a big reader? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. Even with reading, I didn't really get into reading until my 20s probably. And you know, I became a fairly voracious reader, but certainly not growing up so much. And yeah, that day when I was 33, I was in a class because I was taking a continuing education course for a real estate license that I used to have. So you can imagine an eight-hour class in a dingy hotel ballroom, <laughs> and it was just boring as hell. And I, so I literally said, I'm like, I'm going to give myself a riddle, and I'm going to spend the rest of this class trying to solve this riddle to pass the time. And I wrote on a piece of paper, if three people are murdered in the exact same way at the exact same time in different parts of the world, What's the connection? And so I spent the rest of that, that class trying to figure out, okay, what what's a story just even in my head that would tie all those murders together? And I couldn't figure it out. And I went home and I started to flesh it out, actually write things down. And mo those sentences became chapters. And those chapters after 90 days became a 400-page manuscript. And it was truly like this, like I said, like a lightning bolt because I didn't know I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was capable of doing it, and that's kind of what started my writing career. I'm like, I've got a book now. What do I do with? I'm sure it's not any good, but what's the next step? And so that's when I started researching how do books get published. And 19 years later, here we are. Wow. And so, what was the publication journey for you once you had that 400 page manuscript after 90 days? So I was very fortunate to get an agent with my first manuscript, but that's after probably about 70 rejections. You know, I had to research how to find an agent. And my first three books with her didn't sell. She would It would take about a year to get a book fully rejected by all the publishing houses she was sending it to. So I would start to panic and I'm like, let me write another book because otherwise my agent's going to drop me. And I started to realize I really enjoyed writing. And then after the third book was rejected, I really went back and looked at all the rejections and the whys and, and realizing how much great advice there was in all those rejections. And then I used that to help inform me when I was writing my fourth book. And that's the first one that finally sold. So since then, I've been fortunate to have every book that I've written commercially published after that first one. And I just set my goals to try to get a little bit bigger each time. So it's been a fun journey. And what was that first novel that was published? Final Crossing, and it sold to a very small newborn press that ended up going out of business about six months after my book came out. So that book very nearly didn't get published, but it, by, the, by the skin of its teeth, it did. And then the publisher folded up shop. Huh. So with your experience thus far, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? Well, certainly don't quit your day job. And I know that's been hashed out a lot. But that's I, I still have a nine to five job that I've maintained and I've learned how to, you know, write a book a year and do that and raise two kids and have a good family life. So it can be done. Don't think that you're going to hit the jackpot because I've learned a lot about the publishing industry and it's uh, terribly difficult to, to make substantial income on it. And my other piece of advice is what I follow myself is just set goals. That's I didn't write that first book and say, 
I'm going to have, I want to have seven novels published. I wrote that first book and I said, I just want to get an agent. I just got to, I want to have one person in the industry take a chance on me and then I'll be happy. And then you get the agent and you set the next goal. So that's my whole, my publishing journey is all a series of difficult, but achievable goals rather than saying, I wrote one book and I want to be a New York Times bestselling author. It's all about kind of baby steps. I wondered if we could go back for just a second. You talked about the first three novels that you wrote and that your uh, agent was submitting And it was a year long process for each one of those novels. And they were getting rejected by all of the New York publishing houses. And then you said that you sat down and looked at it, looked at the feedback. What was some of the common feedback, if you can recall, that you were getting from editors about those first three novels? Yeah, I I remember one in particular, which has really opened my eyes, is that universally, a lot of these editors thought my hero, my heroes were too weak. And I always thought that was super interesting because I personally love weak heroes and it's, but it's a matter of how you define that, right? Because I write from a perspective, I try to write from a perspective of an everyday person, whether it's a man or a woman. And the idea of like when they're confronted with tremendous challenges that are beyond their purview of what they've ever experienced, they are going to fail a lot of the times. And and that to me is super interesting. But I was realizing I wasn't quite, I was writing the heroes in a way that they were almost too weak. They needed outside help to bring them back up to their feet rather than being their own agents. And that took a while for me to figure out and, and to step back and look at the perspective of my characters and say, okay, I get why you don't like this person. I don't think I like this person either. I like writing this person, but if I were reading this book, I think you're right. And that's a really hard perspective to achieve, right? To be able to view your book through the eyes of a dispassionate third party. Are you there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You talked a moment ago about having a a full-time job in addition to your writing career. How do you manage that in terms of like scheduling and process of, of writing? Yeah, so I, it's varied over the years, but I'm one of those writers who targets around 500 words a day. And I think what that boils down to is, because you're not just writing every day, you might be editing, you might be working on stuff for your newsletter or PR stuff, but it's about an hour a day, seven days a week that I I'm in this role. And I've just learned over time that I I can do all those things, manage a writing career and get a book done in in seven to 10 months if I maintain that. And that's not a big commitment, right? So an hour a day, now it's five o'clock to six o'clock at night. I go and hide in a little room and I just work on that. And then I'm able to mentally free myself to be committed to either my day job or my family the rest of the time. So it's not that hard. It's just, you have to be on top of it and organized and not to fall too far behind. Sure. What is your day job? So I lead a consultancy for the hospitality industry. So we actually consult to major hotel companies about the industry. And I, that's what I went to school for Gotcha. Uh, all those years ago. <laughs> so what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, geez. <laughs> so many. I'm actually reading... Seinfeld's new book right now, which is just all of his stand-up bits. And I'm reading that at the same time I'm reading Obama's new memoir, which is 700 pages. And what's what's fascinating about the Obama memoir, aside from just getting his perspective on his terms in the office, is that he wrote the book. It was not ghostwritten. And so knowing that and looking at how he writes is fascinating for me to see, like, oh, what an interesting word choice or what a way of saying that I w- I would have ascribed to a professional writer sure. rather. So it's, yeah. So I've been enjoying that immensely. That's great. Well, are you working on a new novel now? Yeah. So I have a, so the dead husband comes out um, May of this year and we just signed a two book deal. So I'll have something coming out next year, which is already completed. And then I am about halfway into the the second book that will come out in 2023. So again, all, all kind of standalone thrillers. I will say that the book coming out next year takes place in the same fictional town and in actually the same house 
as The Dead Husband, which comes out this year. So it's the first time that I've had, say, a companion novel. Different cast of characters, but the exact same setting, because I thought that would be an interesting thing to do. That's interesting. Do you have a title for that? It's tentatively titled, or working title is We Who Watch. So it's gotcha. a really, it's a creepy book. <laughs> Great. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? Yep, for sure. At carterwilson.com. And I will say that I, I work really hard on a monthly newsletter that gets a lot of acclaim. So if you sign up for that, you'll see, you'll know more, <laughs> more about me than you'll ever have wanted to know. Great. Again, we've been speaking with Carter Wilson, author of the new psychological thriller novel, The Dead Husband. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Carter, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Now, stay tuned for a brief reading from The Dead Husband by author Carter Wilson. This passage of The Dead Husband is from the point of view of Rose Yates, the protagonist of the story. I've done book clubs before, which are really just wine clubs in disguise. I imagine this one will be no different. My sister's house is nestled in a newer neighborhood called Dairy Farm Hills. Perhaps a dairy farm once stood here, but now it's just a collection of boxy estates that are all colored similar variants of brown. Pour you a glass? Cora asks me. I'm the last to arrive, and the others are chatting away in the living room as my sister guides me into the kitchen. I can almost see my reflection in the gleam of the tiled floor. Sure, thanks. No, thank you, she says. The girls are so excited to have an author here to discuss the book in person. This is typical of my sister. Gone are any signs of her rage from the other day. She's hidden away her demons where they lurk behind a glossy veneer of civility. Happy to be here, I say. She hands me the wine glass. Usually we read heavier stuff. You know, more of the literature kind of books. It was a nice break for us to read an easy little mystery. I sip rather than respond, which might be how this evening goes. Chances are good, I'll have to get a ride home. She takes me into the living room, where about ten other women are spread across two couches and a number of chairs. They all have drinks, two of which appear to be water and the rest wine. Cora introduces me and they tell me their names, which I try to make note of, though I'm likely to forget. I recognize two of them from Max's school. I take a seat and another swig of wine. Most of them have a copy of my last novel in their laps, and I'm still amazed to see my book in the hands of strangers. They ask questions, mostly ones I've answered at other book clubs. Where do you get your ideas? How long does it take you to write a book? Do you know how the book will end when you start writing it? Cora is mostly silent, nodding and smiling, but I see her better than the others do, her tight jawline showing the tension in her face, her fingertips reddening as she holds her wine glass, revealing her tight grip. I don't think she likes the attention I'm getting right now. She's the one who arranged this evening, suggested it even. But in this moment, as her friends are focused solely on me, I think Cora is jealous of her little sister. That is something she's not used to. In the smallest of lulls, she finally makes her move and shifts the focus of the conversation. So let's talk about the book, she says, holding up a copy of The Broken Child, the third book in the Detective Jenna Black mystery series. I, for one, thought it was quite good. Kept me entertained while I was on the elliptical. Helped pass the time because those workouts could be so boring. Though I have to say I did figure out who the killer was pretty early on. No, you didn't, I think. Now it's my turn to clench my jaw while offering no more than smiles and nods. I agree, a waif of a woman says. I think her name is Jenny. I was pretty sure who did it. And I also wanted a little romance between Jenna and Bart. Seemed like you were going there, but then pulled back. I don't write a lot of love scenes, I say. Violence is easier than sex, though both are equally messy. Nothing, not a single chuckle, these women. Her books are more on the dark side, Cora says. Though I have to admit, this is the first one I've actually ever read. I shift my gaze away as I listen to them discuss my book. They're mostly talking to each other now, and I'm just a spectator. A few remark that they like the book, but there are several who comment that, you know, it's just not the type they would normally read. Some didn't finish it at all, and one didn't even read it. I guess she just showed up for the wine. The discussion lasts 15, 20 minutes, and I refill my glass a second time. I never ate dinner, and a buzz creeps over me. Your husband died of an overdose, isn't that right? The words strike through the numbness, jolting me. The woman who said them sits across from me, her dyed blonde hair worn in a long straight bob, 
her fleshy cheeks flush from alcohol. She's leaning forward, elbows on knees, her body language more aggressive than the others. I'm sorry, what was your name again? I ask. Sylvia. Yes, Sylvia, he did. I googled you, she says. Okay. There was an article in a Milwaukee newspaper. That's where you're from, right? Well, I'm actually from here, I say, but we were living in Milwaukee. I'm not sure how that's... Sorry, you must think I'm incredibly nosy, she says, half laughing and not looking the least bit sorry. But Court told me a bit about you, and I couldn't resist Googling you after we agreed to read your book for the club. I saw the article about your husband, and then I read the book. I was just wondering, is it weird? I can only offer the blankest of stares. Is what weird? Being a widow at the age of 37? She shakes her head. No, the scene in the book with Connor. The fact that he also dies from an overdose of prescription drugs and alcohol, and that he was about the same age as your husband. She sits up and purses her lips in satisfaction, as if she's just accidentally solved a Rubik's Cube. Jesus, Sylvia, a woman named Claire says. What a thing to ask. I'm just saying, I'm curious, life imitating art. She leans back against her chair and it looks like she's fighting an impulse to smile. I mean, come on, doesn't anyone else find that strange? I bore a hole through her with my gaze and my temperament and the booze work in tandem to make a decision on how to respond. Fuck this person. First, I say, yes, you're right. You are incredibly nosy, not to mention highly insensitive. Second, the character in the book was murdered. So what the hell are you suggesting? She blanches and her smug expression evaporates. Look, I'm sorry, I just... Just what, I say. You decide it's okay to bring up my recently deceased husband because you found it strange? And you think I killed him because I know how to write a mystery novel? Her lips curl inward and she squeezes onto the arms of the chair. I said no such thing, and I don't appreciate your tone. I swivel my head and scan the others, their faces frozen in the excitement of the moment. The tension in the room is thick, and no one says anything to break it. I expect someone to come to my side. Maybe not Cora, but someone. No one does. I think I'll call it a night, I say, standing. For a moment, I'm unsteady. Whether it's the adrenaline or the wine, I sway just for a second before catching myself. I walk to the kitchen, grab my purse, and take one last gulp before setting my glass on the granite countertop. I don't have to pass through the living room to get back to the front door, but I do. I walk slowly, giving them one last chance to say something. All their judgment, all their thousands of instant decisions about my existence, all calculated without error. And now they have a new decision to make about me, a big one. Did she kill her husband? They say nothing. I look over to Cora before I reach the front door. She's smirking. Of course she is.